All right, if you're a fan of this channel, do me a favor. Don't be this musician at the next jam session. What tune do I want to play? Oh, I don't know, man. I, you call it. I, I don't really know any tunes. Learning tunes and developing a repertoire of material that you are familiar with is an essential part to be a successful and versatile jazz musician, but it can be daunting if you know none and you're starting from zero. So today we are going to talk about the first five tunes that I like to see people learn when they are just starting off on this journey. Cool, cool. Thanks for tuning in. As always, today we are talking about learning tunes and a little bit about how we practice these tunes. Now we're gonna assume that if you're here learning some standards, you maybe already have a few blues heads under your finger. So we're not actually gonna talk about the blues today. The blues is essential. You should know at least a couple of heads in B flat and a couple of heads in F, preferably a few styles, maybe like a riff based blues in each of those keys, maybe like something you can play on the slow side, maybe something you can play a little more up or a bebop head for a blues, but knowing a few blues heads is really, really essential. The first non-blues jazz composition that I like to see my students work on is the Herbie Hancock tune, Cantaloupe Island. This is a relatively straightforward tune with only a couple of chords, relatively short form, and it's going to allow you to build on some of the concepts that you've already been practicing on the blues. And that's what's really important about these. All of these tunes today are going to be things that you can kind of develop your playing with. It's not going to kind of throw you off into the deep end of giant steps or something like that. These are all things that will really help kind of beginning and intermediate players develop their sound. As you're working on this tune, there are two things I want you to focus. The first is the form of this tune. The form on this tune is pretty straightforward. It's a 16 bar tune. We have four bars of each chord. However, it sometimes gets a little bit kind of conflated and not quite set in the right way. And definitely some of the practice resources, especially that you might find online, have the form set up in not 100% the correct way. So let's check it out. So we start with four bars of F minor. That's where the melody starts. Then each phrase is four bars after that. We have a phrase of four bars of D flat dominant seven, four bars of D minor, and then an additional four bars of F minor at the end. So we have F minor both at the beginning and at the end. That's the important thing to keep in mind. How you sometimes see this song represented in some online play alongs or things of that nature is that we actually have eight bars of F minor at the beginning and then D flat and then D minor seven. And then that is the end of the song form after the D minor seven section. And that is not correct. That is not how Herbie Hancock played it. When you listen to the original recording, you'll hear that the solo section actually ends at the end of that F minor section at the end of the tune. So just be really careful there. There's actually an intro on the original recording, a four measure intro. And I think that's why it sort of gets messed up sometimes because that four measure intro is an F minor, but that's actually not part of the song form. So really, really important to keep that straight. This is a tune that oftentimes gets sort of messed up at sessions and maybe musicians who are not super, super experienced jazz players don't always keep the form really straight. So make sure you know what's up. All right, the second thing that you wanna dig into on this tune, aside from learning the scale, the arpeggios, all that type of stuff, the really conceptual thing I like to see people practice with this tune is something that we might call motivic preservation. When we're taking this approach to improvising, we're gonna take a small melodic chunk, something we might call a lick or a motive. So that idea works great in F minor, but we've got to see, can we fit that idea into the other chords? So when we go to our second chord in this tune, it's D flat dominant seven, that idea starts on a C natural, but in a D flat dominant seventh chord, there is a C flat. So rather than worry about changing that entire lick, we're only going to worry about changing the notes that we need to, because those other notes in that idea still fit well into D flat dominant seven. What I'm looking for are common tones, and then I'm also looking for notes that have like close resolution. So for example, that C can just move to a C flat, why everything else stays the same, and the general shape of the idea remains very, very similar. Now this all depends on the type of idea they're using to how well this is gonna work. For example, if we take that same idea and we move from F minor to D minor, it gets a little trickier. Taking the first idea and just doing an exact transposition might work well here because those two chords don't share as many common tones between them. But you could also keep the general shape the same and the range the same and change the actual idea just a little bit to fit into that next chord if some of the notes really just didn't work harmonically. So 
So that version, it's definitely a different idea, but the general shape is there. And so a lot of times I think the listener will sort of make that leap with us. And we're sort of making this motive move through the changes in hopefully a creative and melodic way. So when we throw this all together, it can just give us a real like melodic core to our solo. Now, sure, we're going to play other stuff in there. But this thought process, if I have a motive that carries through my chorus and moves to these different chords in different ways, is going to, I think, give it a lot of continuity across your entire solo. <laughs> On to tune number two. That is the tune Work Song, made famous by Cannonball Adderley, but actually written by Nat Adderley. I released a pretty in-depth practice video for this tune a little while back, so if you want some more information on this one, check it out. We're going to gloss over just one of the quick concepts that I really like people to work on on this tune, and that is combining blues ideas with landing on arpeggio notes, or chord tones, in the appropriate places. If you know this tune, you'll know that it's mostly F minor. The vast majority of the tune is just an F minor chord. But there are a few places where it goes to other, other chords, and these are the places it's really key for us to land on chord tones. So for example, in the first half, the first eight bars, it's six measures of F minor, and then in bar seven, there are two measures of C7. So F minor pentatonic, F blues ideas work really well through that F minor stuff. But then when you get to C7, you got to land on some chord tones there. So the first thing I would practice is ask yourself, do I know all the arpeggios going up, down, inversions, all that kind of stuff for C7. I love to practice this kind of stuff with an approach note before each target chord tone at the beginning of the bar, just to give it a little bit more sort of syncopation, make it feel a little bit more idiomatic. I like to go all the way up and then go all the way down. Really important that you're able to spell the chord descending without ascending first. That's where I tend to see that most people run into trouble. So make sure you practice it both ways. <laughs> You want to take those sort of fundamental exercises and move them through as much of your range as it allows and through all the different chords where you really want to be in touch with where their chord tones are. I would say that's really probably every chord on this tune, but it's going to be really important in that C7 and also on the last four measures of this tune. From there, you want to practice weaving in and out of playing the blues and landing on chord tones. So in the first eight bars, I would really worry about basically just playing blues, just minor pentatonic ideas, blues ideas, hopefully that stuff that you've built by practicing the blues form. And then when you get to that C7 chord, look to land on the closest resolution note and then maybe move up or down through the arpeggio in a musical fashion. <laughs> This sort of soloing is indispensable to us as improvisers and can really get us through a lot of different compositions, lots of different types of chord progressions. As I mentioned, this is also important on the last four measures of this tune. Those changes move a little bit faster, so you got to really make sure you can kind of think quickly and think forward through the changes, but the same concept would apply. On to tune number three, and that is Blue Bossa, an absolute standard if you go to jam sessions. Blue Bossa is a tune that really requires that you start to understand 2-5-1 chord progressions. It's usually the first tune that I introduce to students with 2-5-1s, either maybe this one or the next one we're going to talk about. So the question is, what is a 2-5-1? It is one of the driving forces behind jazz harmony, so we really have to have a good understanding of what's going on here. Basically what we have is we have a chord progression that is made up of the second degree of a key center, the fifth degree of a key center, and then the eventual resolution note. So let's look at this in context. 
So what we really wanna look for to find these, I think the best route is often to look for dominant chords and then see what happens around them. That's a lot of times gonna give us a clue, not 100% of the time, but many times. So if we're looking through our changes here, I highlighted all the dominant chords in red. So our first one we get to is a G7 chord. So from there, I would look forward in the changes and see where does that go? It resolves to C. So if I think that C is maybe my one chord, could G be the five chord? So if I think about my C scale, C, D, E, F, G is the fifth note. So that is a five to one resolution. Now to confirm if it's a two, five, one, we look backwards a chord and we see that, okay, that's a D chord. So if I put that all together, C is one, D could be two, G in the middle would be five. So I get my two, five, one. The same thing would be true in all these different places in this tune. I've highlighted those resolution chords in green and the two chords in blue. So our second key center, where we resolve to D flat, that's now our one. So we gotta think backwards. So if we think about what is five, D, E flat, F, G flat, A flat, that is indeed the chord before it, it's a five chord, and then E flat would be the two chord. So looking for those patterns and being able to recognize them quickly is really important as you develop as a jazz musician because they are just everywhere in the type of songs that we play. Now that we've identified these two five ones, we've got to figure out what we're going to play on them. There's lots of different approaches you can go here. One of the ways that I really love to work this, just to help students hear sort of the idiomatic and typical phrases that you might hear an improviser play through this stuff, is actually learning some vocabulary, learning some licks. Two five ones are a classic place that we do this, and this tune is a very good place to practice that. I really love to see people start with short two five ones, meaning that the two and the five chord are both in the same measure and that resolves in the next bar. However, this tune has long two fives where the two is a bar, the five is a bar, and the one is a bar or two bars or whatever. So we have to maybe modify some of those short two five ones that are a little easier to learn because they're a little shorter and make them fit into a long two five one. So we might take this sort of short two five one. That's a really classic sounding short two five. And we might stretch the rhythm out to make it fit into a long two five. And then I finish it off just slightly different as my ear kind of told me sounded the best. So the place I'm really looking for is, am I resolving to that key note on the five? In this case, it's a B natural um, in the right place. And then am I making rhythms that sort of feel swinging. Because there are less notes now that we're stretching over longer bars, there's gonna be some more syncopation or possibly some more long notes, and that's totally cool. Once we've got that all figured out, we're gonna take this and just plug it in to our two five ones on the tune in a very non-musical way. This is like functional practice. This isn't about you know going on creative journeys through this tune. It is about understanding and being able to manipulate melodies through the harmony. So I would literally just rest on everything else except plugging in those two five ones and I would move it into the two keys we needed. You might have to finesse them a little bit to make them work in the one that resolves to major because uh, the two chord is a different quality. It's a minor chord versus a half diminished chord. Totally cool. Um, most licks will work pretty well changing them up. If you have to change it just a little bit, um, it'll probably work out. So let's see how that would sound. Again, literally just resting through everything, plugging those licks in. Our fourth tune that we want to learn is another one that really takes advantage of two five ones and gives us a place where we can practice them in a pretty controlled fashion. That is the standard Autumn Leaves. Now this one is really a full-blown 32 bar tune um, with A, A, B, C song form in this case. It really resolves around two key centers. I would also add that people play this on a couple different keys. I really think it's best to learn it in G minor to start. So that's gonna be B flat major or G minor. People also like to play it in E minor or G major. That's the key that is in many real books. And there's a few other keys that people do, but I would start in G minor. The, the melody sits nicely on trombone and that's probably gonna be a key that is the most comfortable for most people, but you should learn it in other keys eventually. Just, I would start with G. So we're working on these two fives and because these two key areas that this song is in, the first four bars is in B flat major. The second four bars is in G minor. Those are relative major and minor to each other, meaning that they share the same key signature. Because these two phrases share the same key signature, even though their chords are different, 
many of the ideas can carry from one, the major key, over to the minor key because they are relative. This is a really great thing to practice to get the most out of those 251 likes. Not every idea works in this way, but there are many that you can really carry over and you should just experiment. Like, what if I think about this idea in the key of B flat major? Pretty typical sounding 2-5. We kind of arpeggiate down through the 2 chord, land on some chord tones with a few little alterations in there on the 5 chord, and then there's enclosure around the 3rd of the eventual 1 chord. So can that lick work if I'm going to a 2-5-1 in G minor? Let's check it out. The way the chord tones resolve is certainly different. Now, rather than going down to that C minor seven chord, I start on the flat seven of the A minor seven flat five or A half diminished. And again, where some of those resolution points happen at slightly different places in the lick, but it still sounds good. If we put that with the play along, I think you'll hear that it really works pretty nicely in both keys, even though it probably strictly fits into the major key a little bit stronger. This relative major minor connection is really, really important to playing on this tune well and actually can be really useful on many other types of tunes. You know, maybe a tune alternates between D minor and F major in some sections. You can sort of straddle that line, be a little bit in both keys and give you some nice ideas that really fit across the entire tune. All right, we made it all the way. Tune number five. This is definitely the hardest of the bunch. This is the tune, It Could Happen to You. It's very likely if you're in this early stage of learning different jazz standards, you might be working on the tune, There Will Never Be Another You. That's a fine tune, it's an important one to learn, but if you wanna learn one in E flat that has similar chord changes, I would learn It Could Happen to You. I think it is a much more compelling melody. It is very often played, and I actually enjoy playing on it a little bit more, but they really work similar concepts. Again, it's a full-fledged tune, lots of two fives, all that kind of stuff. You gotta be working on those aspects of your playing. But rather than even worrying about the harmony, for this tune, I would worry a little more about solo construction. If you're getting into the phase where you can play this tune and actually have some stuff together on it, it's very likely that your playing might be quite noty. You know, you're probably working on two fives, working on knowing all your modes, learning all your arpeggios, that type of stuff. And so your playing can sometimes get stuck in like a eighth note driven, I'm trying to satisfy the music theory and pass a test sort of mode rather than a making music sort of mode. So this is a great way to practice to sort of like pull back from that a little bit. So just think about things like, is my rhythm happening? Do I leave space? Do I have a balance of long notes and short notes? Do my solos go anywhere? So in order to practice this, I would set yourself a proviso of, can I play a complete solo in only half of the tune? Only 16 bars. You gotta think like you're a bebop musician and you're getting your little short solo because the, the albums are only, or excuse me, the records are only three minutes long. So you're probably not even gonna get a full solo or a full chorus. So see if you can create in just that half chorus and create something that has a beginning, middle, and end. Once you feel like you can do that, then allow yourself to go a full chorus and then say, all right, well, can I create over two choruses and actually have it be two choruses of good solo, not just two choruses of you practicing, anybody can do that. But can you actually play a solo that is a two chorus solo that might work in a performance, then a three chorus solo, then a four chorus solo without repeating yourself and actually feeling like that solo goes somewhere much more challenging. And so really hold yourself to a high standard on this factor. It can seem like a thing that you don't really need to practice because as long as you're playing the changes, it should be two thumbs up. It's really not the way it works from the audience. You know, you could play eight choruses of eighth notes where you're playing all this cool hip harmonic stuff and, and all that type of thing. But I guarantee you, a vast majority of the audience has checked out by the end of your first chorus. If there's not some space, not some melody, not some sense of direction and some feeling behind the things you're playing versus just a stream of eighth notes. Cool. That takes us through the first five tunes that I really like to see people working on and can kind of get you going 
on your tune learning, composition learning, standard learning sort of direction. Now with each of these, the way we talked about today, where you look for concepts in the tune is really how I like to practice in general. I'm never just sort of practicing a tune in a vacuum or working on theoretical concepts in a vacuum. I kind of think about, all right, well, I want to work on this thing. And then I think about what songs can kind of feature that thing. Or maybe I want to work on a given song. And I think about, well, what concepts are within that song that I can pull out and focus on separately, maybe practice separately. So that way it all sort of works together rather than just like my tunes are over here and my sort of stuff that I'm working on is over here and nothing is connecting them. This way everything is all sort of mixing and then when I go to actually perform, hopefully some of those ideas are there waiting for me. All right, we'll see you in the woodshed.